Namaskar and good morning, everyone, to the Horasis India Meeting 2020. This India Meeting 2020. Our topic for today is very important under the circumstances, as you know, post lockdown, inventing a new normal for India. <coughs> Past three months, we have seen the world changed. Instead of uh, AB and BC, we now have BC, which is before COVID, during COVID, which is BC, and after COVID, what, what it would be, when it would be AC. So what is it that is the new normal? Is it permanent or will we, will we come back to our old ways? What are the pluses of this enforced normal? Of course, there are a lot of things we can say with hindsight that we could have done this better or that differently. So how should the national and the state governments remove the lockdown eventually for the 1.4 billion Indian people? One of the most stringent lockdowns in the world post COVID. How does one mitigate the effects of lockdown? As we have realized by now, there are no simple answers. But to try and attempt these answers, these questions, we have a very distinguished panel here. And that consists of Ajay Nanavati, President Guru, Great Guru Management Advisor, retired chairman of Syndicate Bank and retired managing director of 3M India. Mrs. Mohini Daljeet Singh, trustee and advisor, Max India Foundation. Mr. Prashant Tandon, founder and CEO of NG India. Mrs. Radha Bhatia, chairperson of the Bird Group India and Mr. Vishal Chodia, Chairman of Maharashtra State Khadi and Village Industries Board. And I am Rajesh Kalra, the Chief Editor of the Times Internet Limited and the Chair of this session. So we will start with you, Ajay. What would you do to invent a new normal? Uh, thank you, Rajesh, for, uh, and to the Horasis team for inviting me for this uh, important uh, event. So first of all, I'm going to uh, limit my comments to two things. One, I'm going to limit myself to the concept of inventing a new India uh, rather than the new normal post-lockdown, which has become a lot of people are talking about that. So I'm going to just talk about reinventing a new India. And also, I'm going to restrict my comments in the context of the corporate uh, world uh, rather than social, political, or economic implications, uh, which many of my esteemed co-panelists are far better positioned to comment on than I am. So with that caveat, uh, I, in my opinion, the COVID crisis really, in my mind, has been merely a trigger to accelerate issues that needed to be addressed in any case, irrespective. So I think this is really more of a long overdue reset rather than, uh, a, you know, something that is uh, driven by the COVID crisis itself. I think some of the comments that I want to refer to are really things which I believe should have been done in any case. Uh, this is merely going to accelerate that and act as the trigger. So with that, uh, with that uh, comment, I think there are three major permanent resets that we are likely to see uh, going forward. And again, as I said, I'm going to restrict my comments largely in the context of corporate India, uh, uh, the only thing that I'm familiar with. Uh -huh. So I think the first thing that's going to what we're going to see a huge reset on is going to be the area of productivity. I think uh, we are going to learn to live with doing more with less. Uh, as we all many of us know, India has always struggled with this whole issue of uh, being relatively low on the productivity scale uh, vis a vis uh, uh, other countries in the world. Uh, you know, just as a case in point, uh, you know, the, the company that I worked with for all my all my life, pretty much, when I joined the company in uh, 1987, we were about a seven billion dollar company with about 80,000 employees. Today, we are a 35 billion dollar company with 80,000 employees. So, if you look at how much we have gained through productivity, uh, it's it's really it's going to be a productivity game. We keep talking about India being able to attract uh, investment from countries like China, etc. Uh, but in my mind, unless we're able to address the productivity aspect of it, uh, it's going to be a big challenge for us. And this will also have uh, other fallout effects, uh, such as on, on unemployment, jobs, etc. 
Uh, and again, there's been a lot of talk for many years about this whole concept of reskilling, uh, you know, uh, making ourselves more competitive. I mean, if you see the latest rankings on the competitive index, uh, India, one of the areas that we really struggled with was exactly productivity. So I think productivity is going to be an area that, as I said, should have been addressed a long time ago. Uh, but I think this will really force companies because we have now all learned to do more with less. In the old days, companies were very reluctant to make investments in, in CapEx because the, it was cheaper to hire people than make CapEx investments. Uh, but you're going to start seeing a shift in that in that, in that field. So that's number one. Uh, the second big uh, change that uh, I, 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 I believe you can see is an attitude towards risk, the risk appetite. I think, you know, many companies, all companies have had, you know, uh, risk assessment strategies, risk mitigation strategies, uh, you know, it, all, all these have been sort of there for many years, but clearly it didn't work. You know, and everybody said this was a black swan event, it was unpredicted, so how could you potentially have anticipated and built a risk mitigation strategy for this? But my but mind, that's I'm a bit oxymoron because by definition, a risk is unknown. Uh, so to that extent, you have to be a, a, a robust strategy already in, includes in it uh, the fact that there are lots of unknown unknowns. Uh, you know, so I think risk is going to be how we how companies manage risk is going to be, be uh, dramatically uh, transformed. Uh, the our attitude towards of managing risk, risk uh, and building in building in robust strategies. And uh, I think what you're going to see in going forward. Uh, which we should have been doing in the past is really this is something this is a this is not a static event a risk is not a static i i ran a, i was the chair of a public sector bank and you know our job was assessing risk that's what banks work on in risk assessment so i think the thing about risk is that it is not a one time event it's a, it's a dynamic thing it's not a static thing and it needs to be revisited uh, routinely uh, so i think that's going to be the second big change Finally, uh, and I'm going to cut myself short. I, Finally, I, can, I, I get pretty passionate about this, so it could go on forever. Uh, the other big shift that I got, I think you're going to see, is how debt is handled in, in the Indian context. You're seeing already in the venture capital, private equity world, uh, you know, there is people are starting to realize that this highly leveraged environment that we have lived in, the companies that do survive will be the ones that are adequately. Uh, funded. So our attitude toward debt leveraging will change. Uh, and this really is Darwin's theory at its best. The, you know, the fittest will survive. Uh, and you will start seeing this already. There, you're starting to see the ones that come out of this are going to be the well-capitalized companies uh, who have, uh, you know, adequate cash in the bank. I mean, I was just mentioning about the call with Sasha on an earlier session where he alluded to the fact that, uh, you know, nowadays a lot of the private equity venture capital funded companies are ensuring that their portfolio companies have at least 12 to 18 months of runway uh, on their balance sheets uh, to be able to survive. So I think these are three dynamic, uh, three dramatic uh, transformations that you're likely to see. A focus on productivity, a revisiting of risk and a revisiting of debt and, and how financial uh, on, on balance sheets. These, to me, are the three big game-changing trends that you're going to see, which, in my mind, should have been addressed at the get-go. With that, uh, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ajay. It really makes a lot of sense. And this is what we have been discussing, uh, actually, for the past, at least the past one and a half months anyway. All of us have realized we can do happily with so much less you know, it is more to do with our need and not with greed. In fact, we had messed up the world, the environment with our greed. How what we have done in the past three months has taught us that so much more can be achieved. As you said, productivity is high. Everything is doing well and our lives are still very happy and OK, except for the COVID. We are still OK with the uh, and our consumption is a uh, far less than what it was. I don't know whether it will impact businesses ultimately, but uh, people seem to be happy with the far less. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you, uh, uh, Ajay. Moini, how about you? What do you think uh, should be done? Because you are into CSR and a lot of things which are uh, uh, which, which impact uh, education for one. How do you look at that? Yes. So, Rajesh, for me, 
creating a new normal or the new India, as Ajay puts it, post-COVID, Ajay puts it, means that we need to first prioritize our requirements. And then we need to leapfrog into sustainable development on all the infrastructure platforms, particularly healthcare, um, education, sewage, sanitation, sanitation, with a hard look at inclusive India. If we have to move forward, we have to move forward together. We can't have the bottom of the pyramid dragging the entire economy and ignoring Ignore. environment and nature is probably in my mind what has led to COVID. So these are matters which need a priority. They need to be addressed with speed and scale. We need to come up with affordable out-of-box innovations. You know, a lot of like the UV portable sanitizers, a lot of other things, inter better internet connectivity, cloud storage technologies, and taking these technologies, which we consider to be uh, necessary now, no longer luxury, taking them, let them percolate to the bottom. We've got to ensure that. We have to now leapfrog into this. Another very important aspect is the ease of doing business. I mean, we say we have, but there is so much paperwork. There's so much of, should I say, bureaucracy, the red tape. That must go. And in my mind, leakage of public goods. We spend a lot of money. There's a lot of goodwill. But that money is not actually going to the person we want to be the beneficiary. Maybe very little of it goes. So this is the time when we have to just stop it. Okay. I'm saying it's part of a system. Why? What system is it part of? Aren't we the system? Aren't we creating it? We absolutely must. What you mentioned about environment is something I want to again again uh, specify that it is our worsening relationships with nature that have probably brought us here today. Not only COVID, although at the moment we can only think of COVID, but, but it is dengue and so many things which we lose so many lives every year. Are lives in India cheaper by the dozen? Are we disregarding that? We have to improve the public health care system, public health education, our environment, our sanitation, sewage systems are even non-existent in many parts of even our national capital. This is what needs to be addressed, and this will increase productivity and reduce disease. Intent needs to be followed up with swift and sincere action and pursued till achieved. These, Rajesh, are my opening remarks. Rajesh, you're on mute, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Moini. These are very important and valid points. And uh, as, you, as you said, and as Ajay also said right in the beginning, these are the things which should have been done in any case. It didn't need to wait for COVID. These should be done and we should be, do we, we should be doing them with a lot more seriousness than uh, what has been done so far. If you all remember what happened with Surat plague, that city transformed after the plague. We should use this opportunity to transform the way we live the way we do everything because it's it's required we realize for our own survival we can't do without it thank you so much so prashant we'll come to you uh, you know you have been in the forefront in the past two and a half three months at least with the telemedicine and uh, you know online pharmacy and everything just tell us where do you see the new uh, india from now on yeah thank you rajesh and uh, thanks to your assist team for having me here um so I think uh, someone said that uh, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. And we are really, the, the new normal is about that. There's a lot of learning that we have already uh, got. We have personally and uh, as a community, I think uh, we have all learned how to live 
in uh, back to in some ways first principles basic hygiene keep your hands clean wash your hands uh, uh, do not spread germs all those things that, that how we relate to the environment all those are very strong positives and i hope we do not forget all of those and then build on that for the new normal and i think um, i will talk more about the space i come from which is healthcare uh, that is certainly um, what we desperately always needed and this has just uh, brought us um, uh, it's a, a situation where what would have taken for 5 years has to happen like yesterday so we are literally scrambling to make um, good of what we got and uh, and leapfrog into the future so i think what is happening now is a new health delivery architecture is going to get created in the country and it's uh, it's out of necessity because the easy options are not there uh, for a while the uh, it had been announced that the government would increase the or double the healthcare uh, expenditure frankly never happened now it is kind of uh, naturally uh, uh, there is no other option so i think we'll see a lot more emphasis on new models of healthcare delivery safer models of access and uh, of course for the digital industry these are tailwinds um, but i'll give you examples um, china back in 2012 created the concept of an internet hospital for primary care so that a patient does not put a burden on the public health infrastructure for things that can be handled at the home and when covid happened when they went into lockdown they had a much more uh, robust ecosystem of providers and consumers used to how to deal with it so uh, lockdown and provision of healthcare at home was a lot easier in those kinds of uh, uh, settings i think um, we have we have uh, reached a stage where in india we also we always knew our hospitals uh, especially the government hospitals are overburdened we were we had a model that was not working and we were kind of trying to throw more money at it and hope that that will solve the problem healthcare has always been one of those things that is a 5 10 year horizon so never in the political cycle but uh, what has happened is now it is in front and center it cannot be uh put on the back burner so to me the new normal uh in industries like healthcare would be a lot of adoption of technology a lot of uh, preventative and wellness based healthcare so what I, when i said hand washing and hygiene i think it's one of the biggest contributors to health um and it has become important also the work that is going on with our natural herbs um whether it is ayurveda whether it is any other Uh, chinese medicine any other natural herbs and its appreciation has also gone up and these things have a lot of power so what i think is going to come is a lot of opportunity now from a global perspective also i think india has a huge opportunity ahead of us whether we capitalize on it or not is totally up to us now um because the world is looking for diversification they are looking for more options they are looking for new solutions and uh, i think on one hand through the natural herbs and ayurveda we have a huge market opportunity um, on the other hand just the fact that um, concentration uh, in uh, of uh, demand from uh, mostly china is something nobody is very comfortable of because they have seen that there is a potential uh, disrupt uh, disruption out there so to me the new normal is actually a lot of opportunity coming our way if we only we um, stand up and grab it um, we have to do a lot of things to protect our own um, uh, strategic sectors for example we all know for uh, pharmaceuticals more than 70 80% apis come just from china we need to have alternate supplies we need to have self reliance these were things that i think i have been in conversations over the last 5 10 years with many people who say we must do something but i think now what we are seeing is we have to like uh, this is this can't be put uh, away or ignored anymore so to me there are a lot of positives in the new normal it starts with sticking to first principles that we have been forced to live by over the last 10 weeks and then using the global opportunity uh, to to leverage technology to bring great care to people and also um, the the global manufacturing uh, opportunity that this should 
open us uh, open up for us should we be in a position to take it yeah thanks yeah. Uh, almost there's a lot of a sense of deja vu that we hear all this i've heard these kind of discussions in this country for such a long time i genuinely hope that we actually move ahead this time and uh, have learned our lesson this thing about internet hospital you talked about you know it's not something which is rocket science but it just shows that uh, if you actually start doing this before a uh, before a crisis actually happens you have you know better used to it you can make better you, you know you can utilize an opportunity far better than you would do otherwise because you'll spend so much time learning otherwise at a time when you should actually be making use of it so but necessity is the mother of all inventions let's hope uh, something interesting happens thank you so much so ms bhatia uh, if we come to you you know uh, you are from the sector which probably is be has been hit quite badly and you would know about uh, you know uh, tourism what do you uh, uh, what do you think should be done uh, what should be the new normal for these two important sectors thank you very much i would like to say that covid has taught us many lessons it's like mother nature you know if you abuse mother nature mother nature teaches you a good lesson it was time for us to stay at home look to our families and enjoy the nature what we see today is different type of birds different type of animals the other day on the most busy road i saw a peacock crossing the road and peacocks are a rare commodity so that teaches us a lesson that we have to respect nature tourism is not alone it's a combination of hospitality and aviation and i'm glad to say here that aviation hospitality and tourism will be the first to start they are the worst to hit they are worst to hit because in aviation and hospitality there are lot of investments and you can't do it without borrowing the borrowing part is difficult because there have been no revenues to repay actually i have been always practicing and telling the government that they are partners we should hold hands together to make india a good big economy we talk about start up india stand up india but the question is how do we stand up now i think tourism is one thing which can go up to the villages we just don't have a map every village has some old historical monument some history why not use that as an opportunity there will be lot of opportunities that way they can earn their livelihood promoting tourism to india if you see there are so many sectors which are untouched by the government by the industry which can be developed and i am going to advocate for that the whole world will come one day to see india and the historical places the ram setu unfortunately was discovered not by indians it was discovered by the satellite by the us and that's the bridge that was made thousands of years back when sri rama crossed the sea to go to sri lanka it's ridiculous there are so many old heritages which can be developed 
And I see very positive how we can take it forward, how we can use the opportunities to the best of our ability and earn revenue. Pradeep said healthcare. I think Ayurveda has been the oldest preventive medicine. Unfortunately, originated from India, has gone to Yunnan, has gone to Greece, has gone to China. But if you go to the history, it was originated from India. Today also, we have lost quite a lot. We have to develop. Just for instance, take yoga. Yoga was initially from India, but today on the yoga day, the whole world participated for that. So India would be like a mother to teach all the people how to live, how to fight. I remember from my grandmother, she had a different uh, set of clothes when she was going to the kitchen. They were so protective. Sometimes they used to have a bath before going to the kitchen. So we have to go through all those old traditions and customs and revive them. Yeah, thank you very much, Radha. You realize uh, some of our old Indian customs, if we had followed them, a lot of the things which we are taught about hygiene now, there was no need for us to teach our kids that because that is what we were always asked to do. Leave your shoes outside. Leave your shoes outside. Wash your hands when you come in. You know, this thing I remember in a lot of families is used to happen that you can't enter the kitchen before having a shower in the morning. This was something uh, which has been happening for a long time in several households. The other thing you talk about is the, you know, uh, village tourism. You go to Europe. There is so much of village tourism. Don't you go to these small little villages, whether in Spain or, or France or wherever you go to. And the thing is, they all look the same. In India, if you look at, if you go to Punjab, the village feel is different. You go to Bihar, the village feel is different. Go to South India is different. Kerala is different. Tamil Nadu is different. You're absolutely right. But I don't know how easily we can uh, make all that uh, work the way you think it should be. If it happens, it should be great. We'll come back to discuss this. So Vishal will come back to you, uh, you know, come to you, you know, uh, uh, having, uh, you know, uh, looking at the Khadi and village industries uh, for Maharashtra state uh, and uh, everything else. What are the internal challenges that you feel in uh, making things uh, happen in the new uh, normal? So uh, thank you so much, uh, Rajesh, for the opportunity and also the Horace's team and Dr. Frank. Um, as far as um, Khadi and village industries uh, in Maharashtra are concerned, I think uh, rather for India, Khadi and village industries have always been uh, a primary source of employment. And um, uh, the larger uh, group of people or uh, mostly the rural um, folks have been dependent on the um, village industries and rural industries in Maharashtra. We have a terminology called Bara Balutedars where 12 primary source of uh, employment have been designed by system and also been incorporated in the uh, Khadi board uh, bylaws. But uh, today I see post COVID, um, uh, I think the role of rural industries uh, have have something more to offer to India because uh, it is also with the um, uh, whole uh, new theme of Atma Nirbharta and um, most of the rural industries have ability to produce things uh, not necessarily to the global standards of the quality which the current consumer requires so right now the approach for the rural industries and village industries to uh, take their leap forward is basically based on some of the innovation, some of so, so product innovation, process innovation, 
also uh, scaling up by involving more people and not by automation so uh, largely a handmade movement should kind of get a momentum which otherwise uh, as in the earlier discussion we were saying about how europe villages have uh, been able to flourish and attract tourism i think um, it is also around how we can create some of the right products or best products out of our villages and create a ecosystem around um, then automatically people's uh, attraction to visit those places will will kind of uh, take a next uh, uh, area of interest for example in maharashtra last year we decided to uh, create a one village one product policy so every district of maharashtra will work on a specific product for example in kolhapur it is kolhapuri chappal in um, uh, some of the tribal areas it is honey and other uh, uh, herbs uh, in uh, vidarbha area it is about pottery in some of the areas it is about uh, khadi so uh, in india every district or a larger um, cluster of districts maybe uh, districts combining two or three districts together uh can create one product focused uh, policy where uh, such works can be created uh, government can support that one cluster in such a way that the quality of the product is at a global standard and uh, it is again handmade it is again uh, expressing gratitude towards our rural uh, entrepreneurs and i think um, we have that much of consumption in india if we can if we can join dots in in its right uh, space i think we should be able to generate and accelerate the economic turn around um, at a rural uh, india i think post covid uh, with this atmanirbhar uh, bharat as a mission um, everybody have become more sensitive and more aware about uh we should look at indian products uh and if our rural entrepreneurs can work on the other side of the um product that is that is uh, quality packaging supply chain cost uh, productivity um, more involvement of people i think uh, we have enough consumption within india that we should be able to um uh, use this opportunity to make india fundamentally strong in its economic uh, in in its economic strength ah so true in fact you know where the more we move around the world and within the country you realize how our rural areas have so much to offer you talked about the quality uh, of product being an issue a lot of it also has to do with the perception because of the packaging that happens from the rest of the world and how it is done in india you go out and pick up stuff from the rural areas package them well they would actually be seen uh, as good as any in the world if you you know as i said it's the perception which needs to change how do we do that is a challenge for you know people like you to uh, look at so that what is sold for 10 can be sold for 100 and people will do so happily how do we get to that is surely going to be a challenge so let's you know start our discussion now that you all have made your point we don't have any much i would like to come to prashant and ask him prashant you know you talk about never let a good crisis go waste give us succinctly what are the kind of things that you think should be done to make healthcare in india affordable reachable and everything else that needs to be done to make a shift from whatever we are doing currently just to just to tell you very briefly when we were growing up we could go to a doctor there were no private hospitals they would ask us for a fee and they would cure us over the past two decades or one and a half decades the government has almost taken its hand off and healthcare is almost not afford- affordable to most of the people in this country quality healthcare isn't that something that's a worry and after you have answered that i would ask mohini to answer the same question 
no and i think healthcare costs will continue going up i think um, but what we have seen is provision of healthcare in my mind one of the big things government needs to do is to actually uh, just like it is doing for tertiary care um, take the role of a payer rather than a provider because provide provision of healthcare or any services um, when left to the government actually ends up uh, being a um, uh, a uh, uh, highly suboptimal kind of a situation so uh, for example now with ayushman bharat a beneficiary can go to any private practitioner as well however it is not so for primary care for primary care you still have to line up at the government hospital only if you want to uh, get it uh, for free so uh, i think what we need is a national ayushman bharat for wellness and primary care whereby anybody who is a beneficiary can go to any provider in, in uh, and largely i would say the private sector should be able to step up and uh, and uh, play that role the other thing extremely important is technology we have to leverage um, uh, uh, what is already evolved in many parts of the world and i think um, the mindset change is the primary change that is needed there because uh, what i can tell you is that the consumer who needs it is actually ready to use it it's just whether uh so telemedicine for example we get calls from over 2000 cities and people keep talking about that maybe the, the person in the village would not know how to use it and this and that but uh the assisted models do exist there are cs uh, common services centers in 400000 pin codes uh 400000 locations sorry across the country we can enable them with telemedicine where a person can just help a person get access to a doctor uh, uh, digitally so we we need to create uh, it starts at the top where we create the um, the internet hospital mindset then comes who pays for it whether the uh, whether it's a copay model like a public sector or a self pay model all of them have to coexist and then also actively leverage iot which is uh, remote diagnostics uh, devices that are connected to the net data can we are already and those technologies are now not uh, we are not talking uh, rocket science we are talking it is here and now uh, as one mg we do things like auscultations at home where you take the digital stethoscope and put it here a doctor sitting far away can hear it on on headset now these technologies are there they are uh, you can take an x ray and the machine itself will do the most of the ai based uh, diagnosis and then a radiologist can very quickly um, confirm deny or opine on on top of that um, similarly ai based triaging ai based uh, doctor assistants what they are fundamentally able to do is enable a doctor to actually address a lot more patients in a lot more diverse settings so i think uh, it's absolutely imperative that one we create a national uh, payer model where the government can at least take over the public health beneficiaries supply will not come in the public sector it has to be the private sector that has to be leveraged for that secondly um, i think we have to use technology across the board to bring down the cost and and ensure better quality of healthcare um, and and that is this entire spectrum and lastly diagnostics i think there was a question also on diagnostics extremely uh, key that um we don't see the problem the biggest problem in, with innovation in healthcare is that the there is a system and a regulator whose primary job is to maintain status quo and we know that status quo is not working the innovator's job is to break that status quo how do you create an environment where innovation can happen is what i think is a very very key challenge in healthcare not only in india in most parts of the world what this crisis has done is actually left us with no other option so might as well so i i, I am optimistic that now we now can only we can move only. in one direction which is forward uh, thanks and internet hospital will also mean that uh, you know we have a very poor ratio when it comes to number of patients patients and internet hospital will make sure that one doctor can reach far more people than he would do otherwise isn't it absolutely so and uh, that's where ai also plays a big role the the basic data capture is instead of the doctor having to do chit chat and then ask 5 uh, 10 questions it the bots actually are now trained enough in in fact at 1mg we work on that we published a paper also, paper also within 6 7 questions the bot only speaks with the patient the doctor is not even involved right now 
once all the information is collated and taken in proper context then it goes to a doctor saving at least 2 3 minutes of that doctor the doctor was anyway going to spend only 3 4 5 minutes most of mostly what what does how does a typical consultation happen you go to a doctor doctor asks you a few questions doctor writes a quick something on the paper and you run away Do- nobody has time to explain anything it's much better if the doctor spends the little time he has on comforting you counseling you and the basic interaction part data collection part the machines can actually do pretty better and um, and globally they are able to beat doctor both in uh, uh, efficiency as well as now in many cases in diagnosis so doctors don't need to use their processing power there it is to validate the results and comfort and counsel the patients where they are critically important and should spend more time so i think we free up productivity that way so that the same doctor can actually uh, doctor patient interaction has seen zero productivity in the last 100 years and it's sorely needed one of the key reasons why doctors um, are still in a in a situation where they are not happy with their profession either uh, the way it is going it's, it's, the costs are just not sustainable Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah, maybe you can quickly add to it if you wish to. Yes, I do want to because there's a lot to add. The main reason why healthcare in India is where it is, a very little money. The health budget has always been very low, and as you know, for many many years after independence, there was no health budget. Health budget even now is very low. Three, four percent of the GDP is nothing. look at our population that's the other point we are too many people with too little facilities now i want to say something about the government hospitals the doctors are very good their experience is better than anybody else's because they look after so many people but they don't have the facilities i mean i have gone to aim sometimes because we've been looking after children with cancer the patients are all over the corridors and floors and i marvel at the doctors for keeping their cool and their calm unfortunately nobody is holding their hands and here one of the biggest defaulters is the admin of hospitals and therefore the monitoring by the government a doctor cannot be in charge of the cleanliness of the ward he cannot be in charge of other things poor man he and the nurses are overworked but very often i have had government people like joint secretaries and others when you know we were doing healthcare saying mohini you know the government we can't do it why can't they do it because they are sitting in their offices yeah. instead of coming out on the ground seeing the what is happening and monitoring it now i have grown up and lived for the most part of my life in army hospitals how are they so well run their government hospitals they have no extra funding let me tell you i used to use a lot of my welfare funds from ava to do some things they have no extra funding why do they run so they have no extra funding because there's monitoring you somebody is there to ensure that it is clean somebody is ensured that you give, give maximum for the minimum i remember a time when in the brigade there used to be hardly 10 strips of disprint for the whole brigade things have changed so it can be done this is one big shamming excuse by the government by saying we can't do it firstly put in more budget secondly budget your health and monitor another point is that Ma'am, we have budget, second we have that as well private hospitals um, cannot do it at the same cost because they have to bear their entire costs so we have to understand that but yes there can be more ppp but we the government needs to come down and create better infrastructure most importantly monitor it and work it out it can be done i yes, don't thank you, believe thank you, ma'am thank you ma'am i wish we had more time you know just couldn't get through with all the questions and people who have been asking various questions you know whether it's the new normal how it would be there are no easy answers chiefly because there are no fixed templates for the step forward all of us are learning as we ex- as we move on with hindsight maybe some things could have been done differently so how does one go about post covid we have got some insight into uh, how to go about some of the things in the country 
and we just hopeful that uh, this time shall pass too and we shall actually have something which is going to be the new normal or would it ever be the new normal we don't know thank you very much uh, all panelists uh, for uh, you know taking time off uh, and uh, speaking to us as i said we really wish we had more time yeah. thank you so much and we shall be in touch and see whether something like this can be done again thank you so much namaskar thank yeah. you rajesh thank, thank you everyone you. thank you thank you bye bye